This is the MacBook Pro 3rd generation or Retina. You might know it as the one with the useful ports, USB-A. Um, when it came out, it was two and a half grand. Now it's only 500 quid. Should you buy one? Let's find out. In this video, I'm going to be running this 2013 MacBook Pro through some benchmarks, Geekbench 5, Haven Graphics, I'm going to be running Logic, Final Cut. I'm going to see if a machine that was released in 2013, one fifth of the price of the new 16 inch MacBook Pro can compete in a world with Apple Silicon and, and all Apple's new devices. This version in particular is the 16 gigabyte uh, RAM, 512 gigabytes of storage, i7 MacBook Pro 2013, um, but the Retina MacBook Pro ran from 2013 to 2017. They're all very similar. I'll describe later in this video some slight differences, which one I would buy if I was buying again, and whether I keep using this device six months after I bought it. In an upcoming video, I'm also gonna compare this MacBook Pro to the new Apple Silicon um, base model MacBook Air. So if you wanna see that, please hit the subscribe button. Apple's third generation of MacBook Pro was the last one to be made with anything other than Thunderbolt 3 ports. This thing has USB-A, uh, Thunderbolt 2, full-size HDMI, believe it or not, MagSafe charging, amazing, uh, and an SD card slot. The two Thunderbolt 2 ports can be used to drive two 4K displays at 60 Hz. Can't do this on the new Silicon Max. You can only power one 4K display. These MacBook Pros came out before the Touch Bar was a thing, so you get access to all those media keys, all those function keys, brightness, volume up, volume down, play, pause, all the time. Which, personally, from my point of view, is something I love. I hate the Touch Bar. I hope Apple gets rid of it. These MacBook Pros came out before Apple launched the new butterfly keyboards, which a product which Apple to this day is still having to offer a servicing program for. With this keyboard, you get the traditional clicky, responsive keypad that isn't gonna uh, have key failures and you're gonna have to take it to Apple to get it fixed. They just work. The 2013 model was the last version to feature a traditional clicky diving board style touchpad before this was replaced by Apple's Force Touch in 2014. If I was buying again, I'd probably get the 2014 model because I, I quite like this Force Touch. The device features a 2880 by 1800 15.4 inch display, which was absolutely crazy at the time. To this day, a large portion of the laptop market still ships with 1080p displays. So to find something this good with this many pixels in a device from seven years ago is insane. To compare it to laptops today, if you were to walk out and buy a 15 inch Dell XPS now, it would only come with a 1920 by 1200 panel. Um, even in the brand new 16 inch flagship MacBook Pro, you can't get a display better than 2560 by 1600. Now this is almost the same, but it's still not quite as good as the display resolution wise they were putting in their laptops in 2013, 14. Okay, so let's run some benchmarks and see if this thing's any good. The first test I put it through is Geekbench 5, where it scored 872 for the single core score and 3287 for the multi-core score. The score on the 2013 MacBook Pro is not too different from one you would pay two and a half grand for in 2019. However, when we move into the multi-core tests, the new MacBook Pros perform a lot better. It is worth noting that the multi-core score of this 2013 15 inch MacBook Pro is the same as the new 13 inch mid 2019 MacBook Pro. The new MacBook Pros also perform better in Cinebench R20 and Haven Benchmark 4.0, scoring more than double. So what does this mean in real terms? Well, the 2013 MacBook Pro probably isn't a laptop for you if you want the best gaming performance, but 4K editing and Final Cut, absolutely no problem. My last YouTube video in full 4K was made using that laptop. Scrubbing through the timeline isn't an issue, although the laptop does get hot and the fans do get loud. As for music production, in Logic Pro, I created 70 tracks of Serum playing chords and the CPU was only 23% loaded. Is this laptop slower than the brand new 16 inch MacBook Pro? Definitely. Does it matter? In most cases, no. Not when you consider the price difference and the upgradability of these models. So let's talk about that. If you buy one of these laptops, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is take the back plate off and clean out all the dust. 
this thing probably hasn't been opened in the seven years since it was built and it's going to have gunked up so much dust over the years that they're going to be re increasing the thermals and reducing the performance. I also changed the cooling paste um, on the heat sinks for the CPU and for the, the graphics card. I don't think this was worth it. In the tests I did, it didn't really make much of a difference. So I recommend just getting some compressed air, getting it into the fan uh, entry points, the fan exit points with the cover off and you'll see a noticeable difference. Don't be tempted to use a vacuum cleaner to remove this dust. The static, uh, because of the dust that passes through the vacuum cleaner, can be damaging to electronics. The SSD on the third generation Retina MacBook Pros can be replaced with modern NVMe equivalents with the use of an 18 pound adapter. Now some of these adapters are much better than others, so I've put a link below to the one I used and I've had no issues with it. The adapter converts the Gumstick 12 plus 16 PCI Express proprietary slot found on the MacBooks to the industry standard M.2 connector. Before you perform this upgrade, you need to make sure you're running macOS 10.13 High Sierra or later. The new SSDs require updated storage drivers not found on versions prior to High Sierra. The best part about all this is when you remove your old Apple um, proprietary storage, you can sell this on eBay for about £90. So the cost of updating from 512 to one terabyte of storage, it's probably only going to be the cost of the adapter, about £20. Upgrading to modern NVMe storage will also give you increased transfer speeds, although it's debatable if you'll ever notice this in real world use. As for the RAM, this can't be upgraded, so I recommend paying extra for the 16 gigabyte model at the point of purchase. One of the main issues with purchasing a seven-year-old machine is if the battery hasn't been replaced already, you're probably going to have to do this. Unfortunately, Apple glued the original 8,460 mAh battery to the back plate of the device. There are a few methods of removing the battery in situ. I found using an old shoelace to saw between the battery and the back plate to work quite well. Here's some photos before, during, and after the battery replacement. I purchased my replacement battery from iFixit for £80. If I had the chance again, I'd probably just get a generic one off Amazon. I reckon they're all made in the same factory and you can get them for significantly cheaper. The one from iFix, it didn't have a particularly good charge. I think about um, 7,500 milliamp hours. It was nothing special. So should you buy the 2013 15 inch MacBook Pro? Well, if you're looking for a laptop that never gets warm, the fans never spin up and it'll allow you to play uh, AAA games, then this isn't the machine for you. But if you're looking for something that allows you to enter the Apple ecosystem, edit 4K films in Final Cut, make music in Logic Pro, um, a price of 500 quid, then I don't think you can go wrong with this machine. You get access to USB-A, SD card slots, a beautiful display, and you can output to two monitors at 4K 60Hz. You can buy the laptop now, and then when you have more money, upgrade the SSD and change the battery. The only thing left for me to decide is whether the M1 MacBook Air base model can replace the 2013 15 inch MacBook Pro without the useful ports and without the upgradability and, and all the dongles that come with it. So if you want to see that video, please subscribe. I'll be posting that next week.